In a Nuzlocke, any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever, and you only get to catch the first Pokemon you find in an area. But what if every single one of those encounters were randomized, and more importantly, what if every single trainer fight in the game was a double battle? On top of that, every gym leader has increased odds of having legendaries and megas, so this should be a wild ride. But like any other Pokemon journey, we begin by picking a starter. And while my options are on Mudkip and Charmander are amazing, this one's a no-brainer. Charmander is my favorite starter Pokemon of all time, but let me know what your favorite starter is down in the comments below while you leave a like on this video. And you might notice that my Charmander has the battle armor ability since much like all the Pokemon, every ability in the game has been randomized. And battle armor is actually one of the best abilities for a Nuzlocke since we can't randomly get crit. After receiving our starter, we have to face Shauna in our very first battle, which is the only fight in the game that's not actually a double battle since there's no way for us to have two Pokemon yet. Speaking of which, I can find my very first encounter on Route 2 where I happen upon a Jigglypuff. And Aftermath is a really stinky ability in a Nuzlocke, since we have to be losing to even use it. I then move forward to Santaloon Forest, where my encounter is a Cascoon, which is amazing since we can instantly evolve it into a Dustox. And before we take on the gym, we can actually get another couple encounters, the first being a Solid Rock Talo on Route 3, and the second one amazingly being a Level 6 Combusken on Route 22. I mean, Heat Proof is pretty redundant, but still a pretty awesome Pokemon to add to the team. And with what I consider a pretty awesome team leveled up all the way to the level cap, it's time to take on Viola. Okay, so she's coming in a little bit stronger than expected. And if things didn't seem bad enough, Eveltal already has access to Air Slash by level 12. I'll be the first to admit that things are looking pretty bad, but at least the Avelto goes for Taunt the first turn targeting Combuskin. That ends up really working out in my favor since I can get off a smoke screen with Charmander and then hit Snowrunt with Ember, which isn't quite enough to take it out. This prompts Viola to use a potion on Snowrunt the next turn, and unfortunately Avelto connects with its Air Slash, knocking out Combuskin in one hit. Things are not looking good, but at least I get off a second smoke screen before I send in Jigglypuff. The following turn, Avelto goes for a Taunt, but because of those smoke screens, it fortunately misses and I can go for an Ember, taking Snowrunt into the red as it hits me with a Leer to lower my defense. At the end of the turn, Jigglypuff then manages to land a very important Sing. I then very unfortunately have to waste my guaranteed sleep turn taking out this Snowrunt, which I very luckily hit through its double team. Jigglypuff then does minimal damage with a Pound as Eveltal gets a first turn wake up, but it ends up missing its Air Slash so I can get off a third smoke screen. The next Air Slash, however, does connect, but with Jigglypuff's massive special defense, we can survive in the red on 10 HP. I then miss the Sing, but Eveltal also missing its Air Slash means we can get it to minus 5 accuracy and I hit the Sing the next turn. This gives us another guaranteed turn of sleep where we can set up the final smoke screen to get it to minus 6 accuracy. Eveltal then wakes up the first possible turn again, but misses its Air Slash as I do some more chip damage and just put it back to sleep. My line of thinking was simple, I'll do some chip damage and then go for Sing every turn to try and put it back to sleep if it wakes up. But that's when I learned that this thing has roost. Yeah, if you thought things were bad before, now I am well and truly screwed. I did my best to try and put damage on this thing, even getting it into the red, but every time, it would just wake up and roost off all of the damage. No matter how much I burned this bacon bird or put it to sleep, it would always get its health back. Until something even worse happened. Yeah, this bird has double team, so I'm not even going to be able to hit it. I'm barely doing any damage in the first place, and now I can barely get a hit in either. On top of that, I was starting to run out of Ember PP, and at this point, I was completely out of Sing, which unfortunately meant that my luck dodging air slashes had to come to an end as Jigglypuff falls. So I send in Talo to hope to do some damage, but I just miss a quick attack and end up getting absolutely obliterated by an air slash. I do still have my Dust Ox, but since the only attacking move it gets by level 12, is confusion, we can't even hit dark types. And after another few turns, Eveltal connects with an Air Slash, taking out my second to last Pokemon. My poor little Charmander was left facing the box art legendary all alone, only able to scratch at it. And with every futile attempt to do damage, Eveltal would just heal all the way up with Roost. I was stuck trying to claw myself out of an impossible situation, knowing that one of these Air Slashes would eventually connect and end the run. Or that's what I 
thought until I noticed something pretty strange. Evelto wasn't attempting to take me out with Air Slash anymore, only going for Taunt, Double Team, and Roost. Hold on a minute, it doesn't have any attacking moves left to hit me with. There was never a chance that I was going to take this Evelto out, but I guess I never considered it could defeat itself. I mean, what a way to start a run. I'll certainly take my first gym badge, but our team has been almost completely wiped out. And thus we must find some worthy replacements, the first stop being Route 4 where I find an Axew. And even though Red Eyes here doesn't really need the heatproof ability either, it's still a very welcome addition to the team. On top of that, our level cap has increased to 25, so I can get Charmander up to level 16 where it not only evolves into Charmeleon, but also learns Dragon Rage. Ooh, a King's Rock. Unfortunately, we can't catch any other new Pokemon before our next big obstacle, Professor Sycamore. In a randomizer, this man can be a formidable opponent, but since I have two Pokemon with Dragon Rage this early in the game, he has no chance and gets absolutely swept. And once we've defeated him, we get a second choice of starter Pokemon. Now, we aren't allowed to pick Torchic here because of Dupe's Claws. However, I would have picked Poliwag for two reasons. Reason number one, Poliwag's a pretty awesome Pokemon. And the second reason being picking the middle Pokemon gets us the Charizard Dite Y. Also, having the Victory Star ability is amazing to boost our teammates' accuracy and since we have Hypnosis. I then move on to Route 5, where my encounter happens to be a Tinted Lens Porygon. And listen, while Parfum Palace is possibly the most boring part of X and Y, your garden is a JPEG, my dude. At least here we get to pick up the best move in double battles, Protect. Oh, a Choice Scarf. While traversing Route 9, I also ended up picking up a Darumaka, and after getting everyone to the level cap of 25, Poliwag evolved into Poliwhirl. And with all those preparations, it's finally time to take on the second gym leader, Grant. And I wasn't too excited to see that his team consisted of Latios and Zatu until I realized that Latios' ability was randomized into Imposter. It could have gotten pretty grim versus that Latios, but since we're just facing my own Charmeleon, we can easily just take it out with a couple of Dragon Rages and then do the same to Zatu. With a surprisingly easy second badge to collect, we move on to Route 10, where my random encounter is a chess Spin. Not exactly sure when we're going to get the chance to use Rain Dish, but at least we can evolve it right away into Quilladin. Now, I know I already gave you two good reasons why I picked up Poliwag. However, I did have that King's Rock right before we entered Lumio City, which is going to allow us to evolve Poliwhirl into Politoed right away. Route 10 then has a few mandatory Team Flare members we have to face, but even against legendaries, Dragon Rage can just sweep on through. We then have to do the Karina fight in Geosenge Town, but aside from having a Flash Fire Ferrothorn, which is pretty cool, we managed to beat her easy peasy. Well, what? Not even my ultra powerful Lucario duo could stand up to you? Lucario duo? Excuse me, what? We now have to head through Reflection Cave, where I first find my random encounter being a Munchlax. Blaze is probably not going to be useful at all, and that nature is really unfortunate, but I'm very glad to have Munchlax on the team. And so we're ready to take on Karina in the actual gym fight. And she leads off with Mawile and Reuniclus, but I'm not too afraid of this Mega Mawile since it doesn't have its huge power ability. I immediately start the fight by putting Reuniclus to sleep and then trying to use Leech Seed against the Mawile, but I end up missing. Mawile then goes for Bite, doing some pathetic damage to Quilladin, as Reuniclus of course stays asleep. I can then put Mawile to sleep the next turn and hit it with a Leech Seed as they both keep snoozing. I can then safely set up a Rain Dance as Quilladin keeps spreading its seed. Unbelievable, I actually get use at a Rain Dish. From there, I hit Reuniclus with a Rain Boosted Bubble Beam and almost take it out with a Bite. It does, however, get to do a bit of damage to Politoed with Psy Shock, before just going down to the Leech Seed damage. This reveals Karina's final Pokemon, and of course it's a Mega Mewtwo Y. It immediately goes for a Future Sight targeting Politoed, so I try to get some damage on it with a Rain Boosted Bubble Beam, but it ends up doing about a third. Quilladin then continues to spread it around as Mawile wakes up and just goes for a Sweet Scent. At the end of this turn, Politoed will get struck by that Future Sight attack, so I make sure to swap out a Politoed into Munchlax. Mewtwo then goes for another Future Sight, this time targeting Quilladin, who burrows itself underground, dodging Mawile's feint attack. Mewtwo then goes for a psych up in futility since nobody's been boosting their stats and I can easily just take out the Mawile with the dig. Then at the end of the turn, Munchlax sets up a stockpile to boost both of its defenses since it's about to get hit by the future side attack. The boost ends up not mattering at all since it gets a critical hit, but luckily I managed to survive and I obviously have to swap out a Munchlax here, sending in red eyes. On the switch, Axu gets targeted by another future sight, but at this point, a bite is enough to take out the Mewtwo 
sealing the deal and getting us the third gym badge. I want to be more awesome than I am now. No, well that's easy. All you gotta do is subscribe. Having beaten Karina, not only does she unlock Mega Evolving for us, she's also going to gift us a random Mega Evolvable Pokemon. However, with my luck, of course I end up picking up a Charizard, which I'm not allowed to use because of Dupe's Claws. However, even though I'm not allowed to use the Pokemon, it ends up coming with a Charizardite X. So even though our starter Charmeleon isn't allowed to get to level 36 and evolve yet, we have two Mega Stones waiting for it. Proceeding to Route 12, I decide to pick up the Gift Lapras. However, it's of course been randomized into a Frostlass. And while Flower Gift is an exceptionally terrible ability for it, Frostlass is still a very welcome addition to the team. Taking care to dodge as many trainers as I possibly could, I moved on to Comarine City, where it's time to take on the fourth gym leader, Ramos. However, unlike the gym leaders before him, Ramos didn't actually end up having a legendary Pokemon, thus making him as forgettable as he is in the base game. However, beating Ramos, the level cap increases to 37, so after beating some Team Flare Grunts, we evolved Charmeleon into Charizard, Quilladin into Chestnut, and Darumaka to Darmanitan. Heck, there are so many Team Flare Grunts to defeat in that power plant that Axu got to level 38, evolving into Fracture. But being at level 38, we of course can't use it unless we beat the gym, so I end up evolving Munchlax into Snorlax as well. And so it's time to take on the fifth gym leader, Clement. <laughs> And of course, we have to go up against one of the strongest Pokemon of all time, Palkia. Fearing a water move, I immediately swap out a Darmanitan into Chestnut. Frostlass then goes for an Icy Wind, not to do very much damage, but to lower both of the opposing Pokemon's speed. Palkia then hits an Aqua Tail, barely doing any damage to Chestnut, as a Body Slam brings it just below half. Then, for some inexplicable reason, Clement withdraws his Snorlax, sending in a Beedrill as I use Spiky Shield. Frostlass then gets a Confuse Ray off on the newly switched in Beedrill, and Palkia tries to hit right into my spiky shield, dealing a bit of damage to itself. Being at such low health, I don't want the Beedrill to take out Chestnut with a poison jab, so I swap out into Charizard as I go for another Icy Wind to lower the opponent's speed. Beedrill then hits itself in confusion as Palkia luckily goes for Power Gem on Frostlass and not Charizard. The next turn, I Mega Evolve into Charizard X as Frostlass protects itself and I can take out the Beedrill with a Wing Attack. Palkia being at minus two speed now gets to move last using Power Gem on Charizard, which is no longer quad effective. At this point, however, both of my Pokemon are dead to a Power Gem or Aqua Tail, so I decide to swap out Charizard into Snorlax and Frostlass into my Politoed. Snorlax then gets hit by an Earth Power and Body Slam on the Switch, almost getting hit below half. I then get a very unfortunate Hypnosis miss, allowing the Palkia to hit Snorlax for massive damage with an Aqua Tail. I then get a bit of damage on the opposing Snorlax, boosting my attack with a Power Up Punch as it gets Politoed low with a body slam. I then miss Hypnosis again, which unfortunately is going to allow the Palkia to take out my Snorlax. This means Politoed's about to get taken out by the body slam, however, it just barely survives on 3 HP. One of the only Pokemon I have that's at full HP is my Darmanitan, who can easily come in and revenge kill the Snorlax with a hammer arm. We now only have to face Palkia, and luckily, third time is the charm, and we can put it to sleep with a Hypnosis. I get some chip damage with body slam and set up to plus six with belly drum. From there, the combination of a body slam and a hammer arm is enough to seal the deal, gaining us our fifth gym badge. Moving forward to Route 14, we can find our next encounter, a Beldum. An adaptability is an insane ability to have on such a strong attacker. However, with the level cap still at 42, we can't quite acquire a Metagross yet, so we have to take on Ghost Rider Valerie first. And she leads off pretty dang strong with an Agron and Charizard Y. And so after Mega Evolving, I swap out a Frostlass into my Darmanitan, going for a Power Up Punch with Charizard, almost taking out half of Agron's health and boosting my attack. However, Charizard just goes for Scary Face and somehow manages to miss, so I guess it must have the Hustle ability as Agron hits me with a metal sound. The next turn, I can take out the Agron with a power-up punch as the Charizard continues to insist on missing scary faces, allowing me to set up to plus six with Belly Drum. Then after healing up with a Citrus Berry, Valerie sends in an Alakazam. It ends up being the fastest on the field, setting up its special attack and special defense with a Calm Mind as Charizard X then goes for a wing attack, which isn't quite enough to take it out. Zard Y then actually decides to attack with a wing attack as a fire punch is enough to take out the Alakazam. The next turn, however, after being hit by a wing attack, her Charizard goes back to its scary facing ways, so I can easily just take it out with a plus six fire punch. I hope the sun is shining tomorrow. That would be reason enough to smile. Ooh, wouldn't want you ghostwriting for me. Now having six badges to our name, the level cap is at 48, allowing us to evolve Beldum into Matang and shortly thereafter into Metagross. Ooh, 
Ooh, an Eviolite. Ooh, an upgrade. Heading to Frost Cavern north of Dendemil Town, we can get another randomized encounter being a Fortress. Skillink is a huge downgrade from Sturdy, but Fortress is still an amazing Pokemon. Another Pokemon on our team that benefits from the new level cap is, of course, Fracture, who can now evolve into Haxorus. So as we go up against Engineer Olympia, take a look at all the absolute units on our team. And with that destructive lineup, we absolutely rocked her world, no problem. In fact, as we now set forth on the Team Flare saga, going up against Lysander the first time wasn't a problem at all. Even the second time, I had no issue with the guy whatsoever. But that is definitely where my glory streak ends. You see, as I was taking on Team Flare, a Landorus T got Chestnut down to just 2 HP. And me being the idiot that I am, of course it clicked Surf, taking out my own Chestnut as I got the victory. Why do I have to be my own worst enemy? Things were going so well. Fortunately, however, we have an opportunity at an encounter right away afterwards. Since Eveltal randomized it into a uh, Duosion, I, I guess I'll take it. So this is the mighty Eveltal. Ah, uh, no, this is a slime ball. You're gonna have to ask Viola for the real deal. And so we have to go up against the final fight versus Ghost Rider Lysander. Man, being a Ghost Rider really is a prolific profession in the Kalos region. Leading with Roserade and Barbaric, I'm forced to lead with my Duogen and send in Metagross. However, since I'm facing both a Grass and Water type, I can easily swap in my Dragon Red Eyes as the Rosary just goes for Sweet Scent to lower my evasion. Metagross then hits an Adaptability Meteor Mash on Barbarical, which isn't enough to take it out as I get hit by a Night Slash. All is fine, however, since I can easily outspeed Barbarical with a Choice Scarf Haxorus, taking it out with a Dragon Claw. Roserade then hits a weak Magical Leaf before getting hit by a Stab Super Effective Adaptability Zen Headbutt, which does doesn't take it out because of its Focus Sash. Lysander then sends in his spirit Pokemon Blaziken, which obviously threatens out my Steel-type Metagross, so I swap into Substitute the Water-type as I take out Roserade with a Dragon Claw. Politoed then tanks a resisted Blaze Kick as Lysander sends in Eradicate. The following turn, I outspeed with Scarf Haxorus and use Dragon Claw, which isn't quite enough to take out Blaziken. A Hyper Fang from Eradicate almost does half as Blaziken then hits Politoed with a Brave Bird, taking itself out in the process, doing the work for me once again. I then use Surf with Politoed, which is resisted by my own dragon and almost does half to Raticate. With a Tyranitar coming in, I decide to swap out a Politoed into my Darmanitan and go for a Dragon Claw with Red Eyes, taking out the Raticate. The Tyranitar then hits a Dark Pulse, which unfortunately is enough to take out Haxorus. I send in my Charizard, and of course Lysander's final Pokemon has to be a Blastoise. I then Mega Evolve into Charizard X as Lysander Mega Evolves his Blastoise. From there, I go for a Dragon Claw, which does about 40% to Blastoise way less than I'd hoped. Darmanitan then hits a quad effective superpower against Tyranitar, clean taking it out in one hit, but lowering my attack and defense in the process. That defense drop is of course not going to help me survive this Aqua Tail. In fact, it takes me out in one hit, losing a second Pokemon to Lysander. So I send in Politoed and go for a Dragon Claw with Charizard, dealing another 40% to Blastoise. And of course, Politoed misses a Hypnosis, but the Blastoise just sets up a Rain Dance. This in turn allows me to take out the Blastoise, dealing with Lysander, once and for all. This of course doesn't stop Team Flare from firing the ultimate weapon. Some people just have zero chill. Why does it always end like this for me? Arriving on Route 18, we need some replacements for the team as I run into a Skarmory. And Poison Point is actually a really awesome ability for Skarmory to have. From there, I give the upgrade to the Porygon we caught on Route 5, evolving it into Porygon 2. We can then get another encounter in Terminus Cave, the best evolution, Leafeon. At this point in the game, we have to go up against all of our friends in one long gauntlet. In a normal Nuzlocke, their teams aren't too difficult to deal with, and this time it's no different facing Shauna. No, the pro Problems usually don't arise until you fight Tierno. This man is an absolute menace, his biggest strength being that we don't get to heal in between fights. Oh, and uh, download Waylord. Charizard is immediately threatened out by the two water types we're facing, so I send in Politoed and go for Thunderbolt. It only does a bit over half to the Dugong, which retaliates with an Aqua Tail that does way more than it should due to being a critical hit. Waylord at plus one special attack and full health delivers a water spout, which absolutely 
absolutely destroys Frostlass. From there, I send in a Mega Evolved Charizard to get rid of my water type weakness and go for a Dragon Claw against Dugong, which ends up being enough to take out its remaining health. Hollytoad then hits the Waylord with a Body Slam just to get some damage off of it since Water Spout does way less damage if it's not at full health. Tierno's final Pokemon is a Zangoose, and not wanting to be taken out by something like a Quick Attack, I swap Mega Charizard out for my Skarmory, which ends up being a huge mistake. What it actually ends up doing is go for a close combat, leaving Politoed on just 25 HP as I put it to sleep with Hypnosis. Waylord then goes for Brine, and Skarmory already being below half health from the last fight, unfortunately falls. And to make things worse, all of our Pokemon are pretty damaged from the last fight. I don't have too much of a choice here being backed into a corner, so I send in Charizard who can at least take out Waylord's remaining health with a stab Dragon Claw. Zangoose then stays asleep, and I go for Hypnosis just in case it would have woken up. The next turn, I swap out a Charizard into Metagross who at least has better defense as Zangoose stays asleep, and I try to put it to sleep again with Hypnosis. What I should have done is just gone for Dragon Claw and Body Slam, which would have probably just taken the Zangoose out, but instead, I swap out a Politoed here, sending in my P2, which unfortunately gets caught in a close combat on the switch, and a Meteor Mash even just one-shots the Zangoose. I can't exactly say I'm too proud losing half my team to Tierno. At the very least, Trevor didn't cause any more casualties. With my team devastated right before I can take on Wolfric, we need some new recruits. First, I capture an Anorith with the Defiant ability, which I can immediately evolve into Armaldo. I then head over to Azure Bay, another area where I haven't picked up an encounter, to pick up Turtwig. Having a Ground-type on the team is incredibly valuable, especially when that Ground-type is Torterra. The time has come to take on the final gym leader, Wolfric. Starting with a pretty underwhelming Victory Bell and Beedrill, I send in my Torterra and Charizard. My grand plan here was Mega Evolving into Charizard Y to keep my Flying type and then just hitting everything I can with Earthquakes from Torterra. However, first I end up Okoing Victory Bell with a Flamethrower. Beedrill then hits pretty hard with a Poison Jab, but more importantly ends up getting the Poison. Torterra then finally gets to fire off its Earthquake, however it's not quite enough to take out the Beedrill and ironically activating its Eject button. This this lets Wolfric switch it out, and he sends in a Mega Aerodactyl. This is incredibly bad for my Charizard, and doubly bad since he sends in a Seismitoad. I don't have a great switch in for both of these Pokemon, so I send in Armaldo, who unfortunately has to tank an Ancient Power. What's doubly unfortunate is Aerodactyl gets the Omni Boost. Hold on a minute, is it losing stats? Aerodactyl must have randomly gotten the Contrary ability and gotten a Mental Herb to hold to reset those stats. That is absolutely bonkers, and totally overshadows the fact that Armaldo just got bopped. Speaking of which, Torterra destroys Seismitoad with a quad effective Wood Hammer. Wolfric then sends in Altaria as I swap in Metagross. This matchup is terrible for Torterra, so I send in my Leafeon who at least has some better defenses. However, Aerodactyl attacks Metagross with a super effective Crunch instead as I retaliate with a Meteor Mash, which is enough to just straight up take it out. At the end of the turn, Altaria goes for a Paris Song, putting us all on a timer as Wolfric sends in his final Pokemon, Beedrill. He immediately goes for a Hyper Potion, which renders my Quick Attack completely useless now that it doesn't take Beedrill out. I then Meteor Mash the Altaria, which does about 60% to it, before it hits me with a Dragon Pulse for some pretty decent damage. Another Meteor Mash from Scarf Metagross is then enough to take out the Altaria. I then make a huge misplay, going for a Sword Stance, thinking that Leafeon will get another turn if it stays in, but that is not the case, as a Poison Job completely eviscerates it. At least Charizard can come in to get the Revenge KO, claiming us our final Gym Badge. With another two team members lost, we need to hunt for encounters, first on Route 21 where I find an Absol. I'm not expecting to get any use out of Sandrush, and that attack nature really makes me not want to use this Pokemon. In Victory Road, however, I pick myself up a Misdreavus. And while I haven't found a Duskstone, Misdreavus is a perfect Pokemon to be holding the Eviolite. We then have an incredibly easy time defeating Serena for the final time as she gifts me some max revives. Serena, are you disrespecting the Fallen? The final team I decided on before entering the Elite Four was Chimeratech Fortress Dragon with Toxic Spikes, Protect, Gyroball, and Explosion. Necroface the Mischievous with Shadow Ball, Thunderbolt, Dazzling Gleam, and Perish Song. Lion Turtle the Torterra with Earthquake, Woodhammer, Leech Seed, and Curse. Substitoad the Politoad with Surf, Ice Beam, Hypnosis, and Perish Song. Drytron the Adaptability Metagross with Bullet Punch, Meteor Mash, Zen Headbutt, and Power Up Punch. And finally, our starter, Lubelion the Searing Charizard with Flamethrower, Flare Blitz, Dragon Claw, and Shadow Claw. With our final team assembled, it's time to take on the 
Elite Four, starting with Drazna. She's randomized into leading with one of our signature dragon types, Drudagon, and a Mega Lucario. And I send in my two most powerful Pokemon, Metagross and Charizard, who I Mega Evolve immediately into Charizard X. I then go for a Flamethrower, which immediately eliminates the threat of Mega Lucario. Metagross then tries to go for a Meteor Mash, but I end up missing, and the Drudagon hits me with a superpower, which doesn't do too much damage and lowers its attack and defense. Drazna then sends in a Gigalith, so I decide to withdraw my Charizard to send in Fortress, who's a better tank against both Dragon and Rock. However, it would have probably been wiser to just Dragon Claw the Drudagon, since Gigalith gets taken out by a single Meteor Mash. Drudagon then tries another superpower, which does even less damage this time around. Drazna then sends in a Florges, which is just breakfast for Metagross. Her next Pokemon is a Libani, so I swap out into Charizard, who takes it out with a Flamethrower. Fortress then takes care of Drudagon with a Gyre Ball, and considering her final Pokemon is a Simisage, we just handle it with Charizard. But while my first Elite Four fight went fairly smoothly, I was in for a rude awakening versus Malva. She sends in the overpowered Sword of Justice Terrakion and a Luxray. And the very first turn, her Terrakion sets up its attack with a workup. Luckily, I do end up hitting a Clutch Hypnosis here, not allowing the Luxray to hit me with a Wild Charge. Fortress then ends the turn with a layer of Toxic Spikes. The next turn, I swap out of Politoed into Torterra, who has to take a Sacred Sword from Terrakion, which does about 40% after the boost. Luxray sadly wakes up, but it can't hit my ground type with an electric type move, so I get off a powerful gyro ball against Terrakion. I start up the next turn by going for protect with my fortress as Terrakion goes for a quick guard and Luxray hits Island Turtle with a crunch. The protect allows me to freely go for an earthquake here, taking out the remaining health of Terrakion and getting Luxray super low. Malva then sends in Vanillix, which very much threatens my Torterra, so I swap out for Metagross. Malva then uses a full restore, healing Luxray all the way back to full health. Switching out Torterra here was definitely the correct call as Vanillix hits Metagross with an Ice Beam barely doing any damage to it. Fortress then uses Gyro Ball, which does over half to Vanillux, which is actually holding a Key Berry, boosting its defense. Of course it would. This doesn't make a difference, however, since Stab's super effective Adaptability Bullet Punch is still enough to take that Ice Cream Cone out. Luxury then gets a Scary Face Off on Metagross, effectively getting it to minus one speed, as Fortress sets up the second layer of Toxic Spikes, poisoning Samurott as it comes in. I go for another Protect with Fortress here, since there's really nothing else I want to switch in, and a Crunch does massive damage to Drytron. It even lowers my defense before I get hit by a Hydra Pump from Samurai, taking me dangerously low to just 11 HP as I miss a Meteor Mash. I'm way too low with Metagross at this point, so I sub out into Politoed, who gets hit by a Crunch on the Switch, which doesn't do too much damage, as Samurai then misses a Hydra Pump, and I have nothing better to do with Fortress since I'm all out of Gyro Balls. Since my Torterra and Metagross are low, this pair really cover each other's weaknesses, and I have to just go for a Hypnosis on the Luxray to try and neutralize one throw. Threat. Samurott then hits me with a Hydra Pump, but it doesn't do too much damage since it's not very effective. Since I can't protect, I decide to switch out of Fortress, who doesn't want to get hit by a Hydra Pump, as I swap in Necroface and hit Luxray with an Ice Beam before it wakes up and goes for a Wild Charge, taking out Substitute. Oh, rest in peace, buddy. To make matters substantially worse, Samurott then goes for a Sword Stance, doubling its attack stat. The only Pokemon I still have at full health is Charizard, which I can at least Mega Evolve into Charizard X, getting rid of both my Electric and Water-type weakness. A Dragon Claw, however, isn't quite enough to take out Samurott, so I finish it off with a Thunderbolt from Mistrevus. Luxray then targets Necroface with a Scary Face, which is sort of thematically redundant, as Malva then sends in her next Pokemon, Alakazam, which I can fortunately just one-shot the next turn with a Shadow Claw. Luxray then lowers Charizard's speed with a Scary Face as Mistrevus hits a fairly powerful Shadow Ball. Malva then sends in her final Pokemon, Vivalon, and after full restoring her Luxray, she annoyingly hits my Charizard with Powder, which makes me explode since I used a Fire-type move. It fortunately doesn't do too much damage, however, and I can get off another Shadow Ball on Luxray. The next turn, Vivalon misses a Hurricane as Luxray hits Lubellion with a Crunch, and since I didn't get hit by the Infuriating Powder, one Flare Blitz is all it takes to knock out the Vivalon. Mistrevus then hits another Shadow Ball before I swap Lubellion out for Fortress. Luxray then hits Mistrevus with a Crunch, but we could have taken a critical hit thanks to the Eevee Light, and another Shadow Ball seals the deal, beating Malva. With now just five Pokemon on our team, we still have two more Elite Four members to face before we can take on the champion. Our next opponent is Wickstrom, starting out with a Volcarona and Lee Vanny as I Mega Evolve immediately into Charizard X. Expecting the Volcarona to use a fire move against Fortress, I go for Protect so I can go for a Dragon Claw to take out half the health of Volcarona. Lee Vanny then fails an Entrainment, but Volcarona instead uses a Quiver Dance. Since the odds of us getting off Protect again are pretty dang low, I decide to swap out into Necroface, who can hopefully tank a hit, but Volcarona gets 
3D and just goes for another Quiver Dance, allowing me to take it out with a second Dragon Claw. From there, Lee Vanny sets up its attack to plus two with a Swords Dance as Wickstrom sends in a Mega Gengar. There's no way we can stay in with Mistrevis here, so I decide to swap it out for Torterra. I then go for a Shadow Claw, hoping to take out the Gengar, however, it ends up surviving deep in the red, and I also activate its Weakness Policy, boosting its Special Attack stat before it hits me with a Hex, getting me down to just 57 HP. If that Leaf Storm would have connected, Island Turtle would have been toast. So I immediately swap out of Torterra into my Fortress, as she heals up Gengar with a Full Restore, and a Shadow Claw takes it down low again. Finally, an x Scissor barely does any damage to my Fortress, so I can take out the Gengar the next turn with a Shadow Claw. Libani then goes for a second Swords Dance, actually getting kinda scary now at plus four, and I set up a layer of Toxic Spikes with Fortress. Next from Wickstrom is an Octillery, so I go for Protect with Fortress and try for a Dragon Claw against it, but it's still not quite enough to take it out. Livani then fails Entrainment against Fortress, and a Hydro Pump does over 50% to Lubelion. The Poison getting Octillery to such low health of course means that Wickstrom's gonna go for a Full Restore, which unfortunately means I can't take it out with another Dragon Claw. Fortress then actually has its ability changed to Wonderskin through Entrainment, which if anything is a minor improvement. After protecting with Fortress, another Dragon Claw is enough to take out Octillery. Oh yeah, why shouldn't he have a Mega Mewtwo X? Considering this thing can absolutely decimate Charizard's remaining health with a Psychic, I decide to swap out into Drytron, who can at least quad resist the hit. Levani still obsessed with changing my abilities through Entrainment, changes Metagross' ability from Adaptability to Wonderskin, which in this case is a massive downgrade. Fortress then uses Gyro Ball, which does about 25% to Mewtwo. The next turn, Psychic does pretty big damage despite being resisted, and I go for a Zen Headbutt, which doesn't quite take Mewtwo out, boosting its defense in the process. A plus four X Scissor then actually does some pretty big damage before I can take Mewtwo into the red with Gyro Ball, and the poison is enough to take it out. Phew! Wickstrom's final Pokemon is Raichu, and not wanting to tank another X Scissor, I decide to swap out a Drytron into Necroface. Fortress then protects as Raichu unfortunately targets Mischievous with a Thunderbolt, not quite doing half. Levani then hits a plus four resisted X Scissor, which leaves Mischievous in the red. And unfortunately, that means a Thundershock the next turn is enough to take it out. Losing our second Pokemon this early into the Elite Four is not a good sign for what's to come. After getting off a Gyro Ball against Levani, I send in Lupelion and then swap Chimera Tech out for Island Turtle. Charizard can then go for a Flamethrower, finally getting rid of that pesky Levani that's been here since the start of the fight. Raichu targeted Fortress with a Thunderbolt, meaning it can't hit Torterra because of its ground typing, and I can easily finish it off the next turn with a Dragon Claw, granting us the victory. At this point in the run, I was very much dreading taking on the final Elite Four member, Seabold, since we only have two-thirds of our team alive. However, it seems Arceus has smiled upon me since this fight really didn't give me any trouble at all. Somehow, I had managed to make it all the way through the Elite Four in this crazy double battle challenge, and all that awaits is taking on the final battle versus Champion Diantha. And Diantha is no weak opponent, leading off with Kalos' finest, Xerneas, and Noivern. Immediately, I protect my fortress as Noivern tries to hit me with a hurricane. Xerneas then uses Night Slash, getting a boost from its Dark Gem, doing pretty massive damage to my Metagross before I can actually just one-shot it with an Adaptability Meteor Mash. Diantha then sends in a Ho-Oh. This is a terrible matchup for me, and there is nothing much I can switch into, so Chimera Tech is gonna have to tank that hurricane and unfortunately get confused. An Ancient Power from Ho-Oh then gets Fortress into the red, and I can get Noivern into the red with a Meteor Mash. Fortress then hits itself in confusion, leaving itself at just 20 HP, so I decide to swap it out for Island Turtle. Predictably, she then heals up her Noivern with a full restore. I then go for a Bullet Punch, which would have taken the Noivern out, but now does just about 40%, as another Ancient Power from Ho-Oh barely does anything to Island Turtle. Noivern thankfully misses another Hurricane, as Ho-Oh sets up a Safeguard, and I can go for a Meteor Mash ending the Noivern's career. I can then set up a Leech Seed with Torterra to at least get some chip damage every single turn against this Ho-Oh. Diantha's next Pokemon is then Raticate, hitting Drytron with an Assurance, doing about 25% damage. Ho-Oh then fires off another Ancient Power, which means it probably doesn't have too many better moves to go for. Next, Metagross gets to hit the Raticate with an Adaptability Meteor Mash, which is enough to take it out in one shot. And since I can't hit the Ho-Oh with Earthquake, I don't exactly have a better play than hitting it for 
chip with Woodhammer. Diantha's next Pokemon is a Basculin, and because I gave Metagross a Custap Berry, it is in range to activate, allowing me to strike first, hitting it with an Adaptability Zen Headbutt enough to take it out. This leaves Diantha with only her final two Pokemon, Ho-Oh and Mega Houndoom. Knowing that this is Metagross' final turn, I go for a Bullet Punch to at least get some damage in, which is foolish since it just activates Ho-Oh's Starf Berry. Predictably, Houndoom then goes for a Flamethrower, taking out Metagross, but what a mon you've been. Ho-Oh then frustratingly gets most of its health back from her cover as I strike Houndoom with an Earthquake, doing 75% of its health. With only three Pokemon left, I swap in my Fortress, which is pretty much just a sacrifice play since I know it's going to bait Houndoom to take it out. But its sacrifice won't be in vain since I know Ho-Oh won't take Torterra out since it would have done so if it could at this point and I can fire it off an Earthquake, taking out Houndoom's remaining health. With only Ho-Oh left to face, I send in my final Pokemon Charizard and Mega Evolve into Charizard X. I then go for a Dragon Claw, but with Ho-Oh's boosted defense from the Starf Berry, it barely does anything and Ho-Oh gets most of its health back from a recover. Woodhammer, of course, isn't much help at the end of the turn, but at least I get some chip from the Leech Seed. Then after getting Ho-Oh deep into the yellow, Diantha hits it with a full restore, getting it back up to full, but at least I manage to land a critical hit Dragon Claw, taking it down low again. Again. With Woodhammer and Leech Seed, I get Ho-Oh deep into the red. But of course, she's got another full restore. But through my perseverance, I managed to get Ho-Oh deep into the red once again. To which she, of course, responded with another full restore. However, eventually, through the power of friendship and mostly Dragon Claws, my two starter Pokemon managed to make it through, defeating the Ho-Oh and thus defeating this blasted double battle challenge. This challenge was some of the most fun I've had with Pokemon ever, and for that reason, you need to subscribe right now. And what was that, Munchlax? <gasps> Why is it always me? I mean, it's not fair. What the f-